Welcome everyone back to 264A Automated Reasoning. This is our lecture 10, and today we'll be zooming in on an influential circuit type known as OBDD or Ordered Binary Decision Diagrams. These were actually um, introduced a while back. Uh, there is a milestone paper on this from 1986 by Randy Bryant. We'll make that available for you as optional reading. And it's one of the representations of Boolean functions uh, that has been heavily studied. Uh, some people say it's perhaps the most studied tractable representation of Boolean functions. Uh, it's uh, pretty influential, as I mentioned, and um, it also relates to decision graph and decision trees, which uh, makes it even uh, more important. So we will uh, say some uh, key things about it today along the lines that we said about other circuit representations. All right, so I will now head to the whiteboard so we can uh, get started. We will start by a few examples to familiarize ourselves more intuitively with ordered binary decision diagrams because um, they look uh, different in their standard notation than our circuit notation. And uh, again, this is what we're doing, OBDDs. And here we look first at this uh, particular uh, Boolean function. Um, we'll say it's F and we write it like this. Typically, we would uh, write this as um, x1 and x2, and then we'll put an or x4. Uh, the notation that we're using here is what is common in engineering. Um, and if you see the original paper uh, by Randy Bryant on OBDDs, uh, it uses this particular notation, which is pretty compact. So we'll mostly be using this here. Typically in this case, if I have a variable x1, then I would use x1 and x1 prime, uh, basically to mean this is uh, meaning that x1 has the value one, and this means that uh, x1 has the value zero or false. Uh, true in this particular case. And if we look at an OBDD for this, it's going to look like this. Let me draw it and then we'll see in what sense we have the match in this particular case. Let me make this um, big X here. And what we will do is use the solid lines to mean one and the dotted lines to mean uh, zero. Uh, we have these guys here that we call the sinks. And let me do it like this. And then we have that. Okay, so in what sense is this particular OBDD a representation of this particular Boolean function? Uh, it's pretty simple. You pick a variable instantiation, and let's say in this case we have x1, x2, and x4, and let's say that this is 1, 0, 1. If you're looking at the Boolean function f, you simply evaluate it under those settings, right? So you substitute um, the values here and you see what you will get, right? So this says I need both x1 and x2 to be true or x4 to be false, uh, sorry, or x4 to be true. And if you look here, x4 is already true. So I should get a value of one or two for the value of the function of this particular value, uh, variable instantiation. Now you can do the same thing here by starting at x1 and say, what's the value of x1? It's one. So you go down here. Let's actually mark this. And then you go down here and then you say, what about x2? This is zero. So I would go down there. And then what about x4? That's a one. So you go here. And then we got the same value of one. Now, if you try for any variable instantiation and, and do this evaluation by following paths, you'll end up in one of these things, zero and one. That would be the value. And you should be getting an exact match in this particular case. And this is um, what we mean by saying that this OBDD represents um, the function f, right? So it's pretty simple. And remember that we had another uh, way of looking at these OBDDs as circuits uh, by unfolding this particular uh, node like x1, which goes this way and that way uh, by having an OR, uh, if you call this alpha and this is beta, by doing basically this. And then here we're, we're putting not x, alpha and here we're putting x and um, beta 
And when we looked at it that way, then we realized that this circuit type satisfies certain properties. Now, let's look at another example, and we'll see that sometimes, um, not always, um, the OBDD can have a very intuitive meaning. And in this particular case, what we're doing is we're looking at a function known as the odd parity function. And we're doing this over uh, four variables, x1, x2, x3, and x4. And if you recall the odd parity function, um, I have four variables, so there is 16 possible instantiations, and an instantiation is a model of the function uh, if and only if it sets an odd number of variables to true. And what's interesting about uh, this particular function is that if you represent it as either uh, CNF or DNF, uh, it will uh, uh, require an exponentially sized representation. Uh, exponentially sized representation using CNF or DNF. But it ends up having a very compact representation as an OPDD. And I'm gonna show you how this looks and then we can see what's going on. It's kind of a useful example uh, to have. Instead of writing x1, uh, we'll just put the index of the variables. So this would be the variable x1, and now it's gonna look like this. And uh, here we have the, let me draw the um, zero edges first. All right, so let's stare at this for a little bit. And the claim is that this, uh, OBDD does represent the odd parity function over the variables x1, x2, x3, and x4. And if you think about it, if you can make the following interpretation that I'm starting initially. So let's say you give me a variable instantiation x1, x2, x3, x4. And let's say this is 0, 1, uh, 0, 0. So you, you have to think of these nodes here or there, uh, you end up in one of these depending on whether you've seen an odd or an even number of ones. So I'm here initially, I'm testing one and that's a zero. So I go here, right? So I've so far seen an even number, right? Of variables that are set to one because that's a zero. Now I'm here and I'm a two, this is a one that I cross to the other side. This is an odd number that I've seen so far, right? And if I'm here now and it's a zero, I'm still in the odd part, right? Because I've only seen one variable with the value one so far. And now I'm at four and uh, it's a zero. So I just go there and that tells me that, yes, this is actually a model. If you go ahead and try one, 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 look what happens. So I got in here. Yeah, I've seen so far an odd number of ones. Now that I see x2, that became even. I jumped to the other side. Okay, now I saw this guy. It's again odd. I went to this side. Now I saw another one. So it became even. I go to the side. All right. So there is a specific interpretation for these nodes here and there. And this is one of these cases where uh, you can actually have a clear interpretation of the nodes in the OBDD. It's a classical example that's used to illustrate how a particular function can explode if you uh, represent it in one form, but then it can be represented efficiently in another uh, form. So I would like to do a couple of more examples to orient ourselves further with OBDDs before we go ahead and say some more advanced things about them. And let's do this together. And in particular, I'd like to see how you can uh, systematically represent a clause or a term uh, using an OBDD and make a couple of observations um, there. So let's look at uh, how we can take a clause into an OBDD. And in this particular case, the clause that I have is going to be x. Um, now we're switching to the other notation. I'm going to be using x or not y or z. So the claim is that can be easily done for a clause. And let's see the logic, right? So the variable ordering here that we need, um, because remember, in an OBDD, 
the variables have to be ordered, as we mentioned earlier. I'm going to use x, y, z as the variable order. So I'm going to start first by testing the variable x. And let me put my two sinks here. So these is what we call sinks, uh, the one and zero constant. OK, so we test x. And there are two possibilities, x is true or, or x is false. Now, if x is true, look at this clause, then the clause is satisfied, right? So if x is true, then I should point directly to the sink. I'm done. Now, if x is false, what should I do? Uh, I don't know. If, if this is false, resolved, I still don't know whether this clause is satisfied. So I'm going to check the next variable. And according to the other, it's y. So I go ahead and check y. And now what happens? X, y could be either true or false. Now, if y is false, this is already satisfied, correct? And in that case, I'm, um, I'm done. In that case, I'm basically done. I will just go to uh, 1. But if x is true, then I don't know. And I'm going to go ahead and check z. And similarly for z, if z is true, this is satisfied. So I basically go to one here and I go to zero in this particular case. And this would be the OBDD representation of this particular clause. All right. Now let's do something similar, but for a term, and then we will make an observation. Actually, I will be asking you a question after that. So in this case, what we're going to do is term into an OBDD. And let's go for the term x and not y and z. All right. So same story. You're going to go and start with the variable x. So again, we're using the uh, variable order um, x, y, z. And here are my two things in this case. And let's see what happens. You test x. All right. Uh, if x is false, I'm done. This whole thing is false, right? So if x is false, then I, I point to that guy 0, and we're done. If x is true, I need to do more work. And in this particular case, I need to check y. Now, if y is true, then this whole thing is false. And again, it's over, game over. Um, and then I would go to this guy. But if x is false, I still don't know. I need to see what the value of that guy is. So I'm going to check z. And if z is true in that case, then yes, the whole thing evaluates to true. Otherwise, it evaluates to false. All right. So this is basic observations uh, that I can easily map a clause or a term into an OBDD. And uh, that can be done in linear time. So you need to do that. So now I'm going to ask you a question. And then we'll move to something a little bit more advanced. The question is the following. I do have uh, two BDDs, not OBDDs, BDDs, right? So a binary decision diagram, what does that mean? That means there is no restriction on the ordering. There is no restriction that a particular variable has to be tested once on every path from the uh, root to the leaf, right? So it's just a decision graph. So think of this as um, basically a decision graph. No properties on it. So you could have x here, and then you go down here, and you do y, da, da, da. And it's possible that you test x again and so on, all right? So this is possible in this case. Now, the question that I have for you is, let's say I have um, two uh, BDDs, and I'm going to draw them pictorially like this. Uh, this is the first one, and that's the root of it. Uh, let's make it like this. And let's say these are the two sinks, and this is a 0, and this is a 1. And here's the other one. I'm drawing pictorial like this. And this is uh, the root of that guy. Maybe you should do the two of these guys here. And again, this is the uh, two things for it. And let's call this delta 1 and call this delta 2. And what I want to do is get an ABDD that represents their conjunction. That is, that represents delta 1 and delta 2. Can I do that easily? Right, so this is a BDD and this is a BDD. And I want the outcome just to be a BDD. 
that represents the conjunction, right? Is, is, can that be easily done? I do have an answer here, which basically says, uh, take the sink of this guy out and make it go ahead and uh, point, instead of going to the sink, let it go to actually this guy here, all right? And the suggestion is then this guy will go away and then we will have one BDD that looks like this, all right? So this is now the root. And according to this BDD, da, 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 I'm checking certain things. I may end up in a zero, uh, then I know that I'm done. And, but I may end up in a one. And this guy, guy says, no, if, you're, if you end up with a one, you're not done yet. You got to go check the other guy and see what happens. And indeed, uh, this would be the correct answer in this case. Now, it was easy to do this conjoining to BDDs because they're BDDs. There is no properties that I have to maintain like ordering and so on. Later, we will talk about how to conjoin two OBDDs and it's not as simple as this. And this it cannot be done in linear time like this, but we will see that actually can be done in quadratic time. And we will see the algorithm for that. And that algorithm end up being the same algorithm for combining them using any Boolean operator. Uh, but this is, uh, again, just to familiarize ourselves a little bit more with this. And you can try to convince yourself this was a conjunction. If you wanted to disjoin these two BDDs, it would be something very similar. But instead of having the one sync point to that guy, you basically end up in that case having the zero sync point. So you have this guy point to that guy instead, and that will end up being the disjunction of these two BDDs. All right, folks, so this is as far as basics and familiarizing ourselves with uh, what's going on here. And now let's go ahead and tackle some other um, important uh, subjects about OBDDs. And the first one we will be looking at is this notion of a reduction and canonicity. So, this is an important topic because it contributes to what's known as a main property of OBDDs. So here we're gonna talk about reduced OBDDs. And in short, a reduced OBDD is an OBDD that does not have redundant or useless nodes. And we'll see that concretely next, but just up front. The importance of this notion of being reduced, that is you do not have um, redundant nodes, is a claim or is a main property of OBDDs, and let me write it up front before uh, we forget it, that there is, there is a unique reduced OBDD for a fixed var order. So if you Say I'm building an OBDD for this Boolean function and I'm using this particular order. If we do not insist on reduction, if we do not insist that you're not supposed to have redundant nodes, then two of you may end up constructing two different OBDDs using that variable order. However, if we say, no, you're not allowed to have redundant nodes, you must construct a reduced OBDD, then everyone will end up constructing the exact same thing. There is no other way of constructing that OBDD. And that actually uh, means, and, and you'll hear the claim is that reduced OBDDs are canonical. This is a pretty important term. Uh, when people talk about representations, they would say, is the representation canonical? That is, if I give you the Boolean function and I say represented according to these conditions, can multiple things have satisfy that condition? Uh, if you can have multiple things, then it's not canonical. If there's only way of representing something, then we would say the representation is canonical and reduced OBDDs are canonical. In fact, there was a time where you would hear people would write R O B D Ds to mean reduced order binary decision diagrams. You don't see that R a lot these days. Uh, you hear OBDDs, but the implicit assumption is they are reduced because it doesn't make sense not to work with reduced ones and reducing OBDDs is easy as you will see. So what is a reduced OBDD? 
and and we get to that by talking about what kind of redundancies you can have in an OBDD. And there's two of them, basically only. One of them is the following situation. So let's say you have uh, this node X in an OBDD and you've got a bunch of things pointing to it. Let's call this Z1, Z2. And then you have another Y there. And let's say in this case, if you if X is false, you go this way. If X is true, you go that way, all right? So this is redundant. There is no point testing X, right? Because regardless of what the value, I'm always gonna go to Y. So what you want to do in this case is get rid of that variable X or that node, not the variable, the node labeled uh, X. And uh, you have Y here. And those two edges just go directly to um, Y. And this is known as the deletion rule, right? So we're just getting rid of these redundant guys. And then there is another type of redundancy, which we've also seen before. Let me draw the picture here. So you have two uh, decision nodes uh, over variable X. And let's say we have here, and this guy, let's say you have A, B here and pointing to it, and let's say CD pointing to that. Now, suppose uh, in this particular case, a low takes you to this, high takes you to that. But similarly for this guy, low takes you to this, and high takes you to that. In this case, uh, these are redundant, right? I don't need both of them because I'm doing precisely the same thing depending on the value of X, whether I'm here or there. So the idea is I'm gonna get rid of one of them and just have one of these decision nodes and it's gonna be like this. And then what happens? Uh, all of these guys end up pointing to uh, this guy. So if we are we're thinking about removing this, then I have its parents being directed to that and this is good enough, all right? And this is known as the merge rule. That's it. So you have these two properties or these two kind of redundancies. And we will say that an OBDD is reduced if you cannot apply the deletion rule or the merge rule. If there are opportunities to apply either of these rules, then it is not reduced. And if I show you an OBDD and, and you look and say, there is no way I can apply these rules, then the OBDD is reduced. And that's basically the definition uh, for us. So reduced OBDD means basically cannot apply deletion or merge rules. Now you can easily take an OBDD and uh, apply these rules up to the point where you're gonna get an OBDD. And one simple way of doing this is you traverse the OBDD bottom up and then look for opportunities to apply these. You do just one pass uh, bottom up and at every um, level, uh, because in an OBDD, when you have variables, let's say according to this order, x2, uh, x1, x2, da, 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 xn, you can think of uh, nodes of the OBDD belonging to a certain level. So the, the sinks will belong to level n plus one, right? And every node that is labeled with xn, we will say that's at level n and so on. So what you do in this case is you would go bottom up looking at every node that's labeled with xn, and see applications of that. And then you move to nodes that are labeled with X and minus one, da, da, da. And uh, can, you can reduce the OBDD this way. And we'll see later the uh, way to obtain OBDDs or uh, when you're compiling OBDDs, you end up ensuring this process in a built-in way. And we'll see how, how that works. But let's just take a quick concrete example here. Uh, on this reduction process uh, before we move on to something else. So here I'm gonna show you this particular OBDD. And again, I'm not gonna draw the variables. Uh, I'm just gonna give you their indices. So this would be X1 and this would be X2. And uh, I have two nodes labeled with X3 and one labeled with X4. And then I have two things. So I'm gonna draw this twice and I'll tell you why. So we have these high edges. Remember, uh, when an edge corresponds to one, we call it a high edge. And when it's like this one uh, dotted, that's a low edge. 
Okay, so this is what we have as our OBDD and, and stare at it. And you should be able to conclude that it is actually not reduced. You can already see an application here for um, the deletion rule. Now, let me go ahead and do it once more because I'm gonna edit the next version, but I don't want you to lose vision of the original one that we started with. And this is three, three, two, one, four. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is start applying uh, these rules and we're gonna do it in a bottom-up fashion. And you have to realize one of the phenomena that you're gonna see, the order in which you apply them matters because sometimes um, you may not have an opportunity for one of the rules. Like look at this three and three. In this case, uh, there is no opportunity for doing merge, uh, right? Because the children are not exactly the same, but uh, you'll see when we do some other rule, there will be an opportunity. So we start bottom up. So we're looking at four. Now there is an actual opportunity to do to do deletion here. So I'm gonna go and delete this guy as we discussed, and then basically just have the parent that it has, uh, you know, point to the sink in this particular case. So now I have this particular situation, all right? And now I move to this level. And if you're looking at this level, uh, there is now an opportunity to basically apply the merge rule because now these are identical. Uh, they, they have the same high child and the same low child, all right? So what do I do in that particular case? Well, as we discussed, I need to get rid of one of them. Let's get rid of this guy. And then I need the parent, this guy, instead of pointing to this, ends up pointing to that. So it will be like this and basically all of this goes away here, right? So um, now I actually simplified quite a bit. And now this is gone from, from this part here. Okay, good. Now, then you move to the next level and look what happened here. Now there is an opportunity to do deletion. So I actually get rid of this guy and have its parent point directly to three and that would be my final um, OBDD. Right, so this is basically what I got. Quite a bit of simplification, right? So this is basically reduced and this is not reduced, but they're equivalent. They represent the same Boolean function. And you can imagine if I did not insist on reduction, uh, okay, this is one variant. You could have come up with something else that doesn't look like this or that, uh, which is still equivalent to these guys represent the same Boolean function. But if you insist on reduction, right, and I'm using the variable order one, two, three, four, there's only one way to do it, which is this guy. That's the only reduced OBDD for this function under the variable order one, two, three, and this is pretty important, okay? This is one of the main celebrated results about OBDDs is that they are canonical. And canonicity has quite a bit of implications on many things. Um, one of them, since we're already here, uh, which re received a lot of attention at that time when uh, people were thinking about these things uh, a few decades ago, is equivalence, equivalence testing. Equivalence testing that is taking two circuits and deciding whether they're equivalent, whether they represent the same thing has a lot of applications, particularly in an area known as formal verification where, uh, for example, you build something and according to some specifications and you wanna know if uh, what you built indeed is equivalent to these specifications. Uh, if you're building real circuits like in CAD and someone went and said, you know what, your circuit is too big, I can optimize it. You don't need these gates, you don't need these wires, I can do something to it. And then they go edit it and they give you something that is uh, half as big. How do you know that they did not actually mess up the function that's represented by this circuit and what they did is sound that end up being reduced to an equivalence test? So let me ask you a question. Why it, it, the claim is if your representation is canonical, then that helps you with equivalent testing. Can anybody say why? Why is canonicity helpful if you care about equivalence and testing equivalence efficiently? I got two things. I wanna see if they are equivalent. How does canonicity help you with implementing uh, 
an efficient equivalence test. Okay, someone say reduce both to canonical form and test if they have the same canonical form. Absolutely. So if you have, let's say, two CNFs, and you want to know whether they're equivalent, one way to do this is compile the first to an OBDD and compile the second into an OBDD. Just make sure that you're compiling with respect to the same variable order and uh, you're producing reduced OBDDs. And then the two CNFs will be equivalent if you come up, uh, you end up having equivalent compilations. If you do this in a certain way, we'll talk about this later, it ends up being just a, a pointer check, uh, whether the first compilation and the second compilation are pointing to the same thing. Very good. Okay, now let's move on next to an um, important topic. And this is the topic of variable orders and the significance that variable orders may have on the size of the OBDDs. The short story is, depending on which variable order do you use, the size of the OBDD can vary from being linear to being exponential, right? So it's very significant. And for a while, there was a lot of work where people were just thinking about finding the right variable order to use. And we will talk more about this later as far as how do you come up with good variable orders when we talk about compilation algorithms, bottom-up compilation algorithms, like we talked about top-down. But let's look at the theoretical basis for this because it's actually a fascinating story. What I'm going to do is I'm going to first start with an example um, concrete one that shows you the impact of uh, the variable order. Uh, this is a canonical example used to illustrate how it could be linear versus exponential. And then we'll see why. And in the process of seeing why, we will introduce a major result known as the ceiling and Wagner bound. We'll end this segment with. But let's look at this particular function. And that function is um, f and here we have a, b plus c, d plus e, f, all right? So again, this is d and f written in the engineering notation. And I'm gonna give you two orders that we could use here. And, and I actually would like you to vote on which one, the claim is one of them will give you a very efficient OBD, the other will not. And I want you to make a guess just based on intuition. So in the first, case, I'm going to do A, B, C, D, E, F. And in the other one, I'm going to do A, C, E, B, D, F. So here I'm saying test this, then this, then this, then this, da, da, da. This one I'm saying test A, then test C, then test E, and then go back. Test B, D, F, right? Two ways of doing things. And I'm already getting votes here. Everybody's saying that two is better. Everybody is, I have four answers so far, and they all say that uh, two is uh, better. Well, we're gonna look at it in some detail, but it turns out that if you were to, for this particular function, uh, uh, come up with a canonical uh, that is reduced OBDDs using this order, you're gonna end up having eight nodes in the OBDD. But if you actually use this, you're gonna get 16 nodes. And more generally, if you have the function f, and here we're doing x1, x2, plus x3, x4, right? The same pattern, but we're making it general, da, 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 plus x, 2n minus 1, x2n. So what we have here is 2n variables, right? From x1 all the way till x2n, and this is it. This generalizes this. Now, if you use this var order uh, 1, which is x1, x2, x3, all the way till x2n, if you use that, you're going to get 2n plus 2 nodes. But if you use this other order, 
which is I'm starting with x1 and then x3 and then x5 da 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 and then I'm going back and doing x2 um, x4 x6 da 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 all the way till um, x2n in this case you end up with 2n to the n plus 1 nodes so in this case it is linear in this case it is exponential Okay, big difference between these two guys. So what's going on here? And uh, why is that the case? And this is what we're gonna be doing um, next. We would look at this in a little bit more detail and that will bring up this notion of a subfunction, very important notion called the subfunction and the notion of how many distinct subfunctions do you end up having? Uh, it's something actually that we saw last time, uh, but not in this particular context. So it's not going to be too unfamiliar uh, for you when we um, actually do it. All right. Okay. So we will go and dive into that example and uh, we will see what happens. So what we'll do now is the following. Um, we will look at a portion of this function and that is f equals x1, x2, plus x3, x4, plus x5, x6, okay? That's what we're gonna look at. And now we will look at both orders that we mentioned. But what we'll do is look at what happens after I set the first three variables in each order. So the first order was the natural order, one, two, three, four, five, six. So x1, x2, x3. And if you look in this particular case, you're basically, uh, there are eight possible instantiations for these guys, all right? And the question that we're gonna be looking at, how does the function look when I end up setting these first three variables according to one of these combinations? And then we'll do the same thing uh, using the other uh, variable order. And that will give us a major insight about what's going on, okay? So this is the first table we're gonna be looking at. And then the next table we're gonna be looking at will look very similar, except that I'm gonna be doing what? X1, then X3, and then X5, okay? And um, we will compare the two. So give me a second to just do this here. Okay, so what I need you to help me with, or at least start thinking about, is how does the function simplify under each one of these settings, right? And when we do that, when we take a function and simplify it under some variable settings, like in this case, if I take this function and simplify it under this variable being zero, this variable being zero, this variable being zero, we get something that we call a subfunction. Okay, anytime you take a function and fix the value of some variables, we get a subfunction. And our main goal here is to see what kind of subfunctions we're gonna get in each one of these uh, cases. Okay, so help me out with the very first one. Uh, what happens here? If you take this function and set these three variables to these values, what does this reduce to? Can someone type something in this particular case? Right, so I'm setting this guy to zero, zero. Okay, I'm getting a bunch of answers. It should be, okay, five, six, correct. So it would be X5, X6. All right, and this guy end up being X4 plus X5, X6. And the third guy ends up being X5, X6. And then this guy ends up being x4 plus x5, x6. And then I'm going to get x5, x6. And then I'm going to get x4 plus x5, x6. Now do the last two ones for me. What should I get in the last two ones? So this is where I set everything to one or one, one, zero. What should I get in these cases? Okay, good. People are saying true, true. That is one, one. Fantastic. Let me go and do these guys as well. This should end up being zero and this end up being X6 and this ends up being X4 and this ends up being X4 plus X6 
And uh, let me finish this off. All right, I think we have gotten all subfunctions that we need in this uh, particular case. And uh, now we're gonna make a whole bunch of observations. Here's the thing, that, let's look at this guy. Okay, and the first question you have to ask yourself is, how many distinct subfunction? So this here is the subfunction that I get from having set these variables to that value. And this is the subfunction I've gotten by setting these variables to these values. And the question that I have is how many distinct subfunctions do we have here? So we want to contrast these guys, distinct subfunctions. How many here? And the same thing, I'm going to eventually look at distinct sub um, functions in this particular case. So in the first case, people are saying three. Uh, well, let's count them. Uh, one, that's one guy. And then I have the other, okay, here's one. This is a distinct and that distinct. And everything else is a replica of that. So in this particular case, I only have three total. Okay, let's look here. How many I'm getting in this case? How many distinct subfunctions am I getting in this case? And people um, are saying we're getting eight. Every instantiation of the variables is giving me a different subfunction. Okay, this ends up being the secret of whether a variable order is gonna be good or bad. And when we come back from our break, we will show you a theorem that tells you that this number of subfunctions or distinct subfunctions that you got end up corresponding to how many nodes you're going to have in the OBDD after you have tested x1, x2, and x3. So what you want is a variable order that leads to basically the smallest number of subfunctions. We're going to make one more observation here before we take our break because we needed to come when we come back to state the uh, official result that relates this notion of subfunctions to uh, the size of the OBD. And this is whether a function depends on a variable. Sometimes people say whether a function essentially depends on a variable. Let me tell you what I mean. In this order, we did x1, x2, x3. What's the next variable that should come up after that? This is the natural order. Uh, if, if we are building the OBDD based on this natural order, uh, which is x1, x2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the next one will be x4. Good. So let's put this here in blue. So the next thing that's going to happen is x4. And then you ask yourself, how many of these three, fun we have three of them, how many really depend on x4? Depend on x4 intuitively means, does the value of x4 matter for that function? And if you can see, it doesn't matter for this guy. Uh, it does matter for this guy. It doesn't matter for that guy. So uh, in a way, this is independent of x4. This is not independent. This is independent. So we say, does the function essentially depend on a particular variable? Let's look here. In this case, remember, let me actually write these, uh, the orders. The orders here were meant to be one, two, three, four, five. And the order here was meant to be one, three, five, and then two, four, six. So the next variable that we're supposed to look at in the OBDD uh, would have been X2, correct? And uh, now how many depend of these functions actually depend on that particular variable x2? So I'm going to write it here, uh, depends on x2. I need a count. And here depends on x4. I need a count. And in this case, the count was just um, one. And here, how many of them depend on x2? Okay, people uh, said four of them, uh, four of these function depend on the variable x2 and the other four do not depend. So when we come back from our break, we're going to state the theorem, which is known as the Seeling and Wegener theorem, which basically tells you precisely how many nodes you're going to get at every level of the OBDD based on the notion of a distinct sum function and whether that function essentially depends on a variable or not. Let's take our break and let's come back at 11. Thank you.